All right, spectroscopic analyzers. Hopefully you can see that in a couple seconds. Yes, sir, it's all up. Okay, perfect. All right, slideshow from the beginning. There we go. Spectroscopic analyzers, um, 310404D, uh, looking like we've got 40 pages or so, 41, 42 pages, um, and I'm on version 21. So what are we going to learn in this? Well, if we look at this word in here, uh, spectroscopic, it's going to be part of the light spectrum. So uh, spectroscopic is going, we're going to deal with the light spectrum and we're going to talk about that all the way from UV to visible light to infrared and the, and the, less, uh, the less light spectrum that um, has less energy. And we talk about the energy too and how light travels and all that kind of stuff in this uh, module. So your learning objectives are going to be described electromagnetic spectrum and electromagnetic radiation. That word radiation always gets us, but that's how light travels, right? And it is a radiation. Uh, describe absorption and emission spectrums. And we're talking about absorption and emissions. When we talk about absorption, we're talking about certain chemicals, certain uh, atoms, uh, certain molecules which absorb light. And then there's emission too, which certain like SO2 will em emit some a light spectrum when it's uh, infiltrated with uh, U UV light. We got describe the principles and analysis of application of spectroscopic analyzers. We're going to talk about again uh, infrared, ultraviolet, and chemiluminescence in this ILM. And the fourth. Uh, um, learning objective is describe Beer Lambert's absorption laws to infrared and ultraviolet absorption analyzers. We'll be doing some calculations. Uh, they're fairly easy, they're fairly simple, and they are in our, uh, our absorption, I should say, our um, formula book. So we don't have to remember these. I'll point them out. We'll go through a couple examples. And the last one is describe fluorescence and chemiluminescence. So first page, describe the electromagnetic spectrum and electromagnetic radiation. Uh, spectroscopy is the science of dealing with the way matter interacts with different types of electromagnetic radiation. So your electromagnetic radiation is going to be part of the light spectrum in this case. So electromagnetic uh, refers to radiation that consists of electrical and magnetic waves that travel through space. And we'll, we will um, we'll show you how this is done, not how this is done, but we'll show you these uh, magnetic waves and electromagnetic waves. So qualitative analysis is typically occurred in the laboratory and quantitative analysis is commonly done in the lab or continuously in process applications. So this qualitative and quantitative analysis comes up every time on these uh, analyzers just because this is what we're actually doing, each one of them. So two theories describe the properties of radiation, wave theory matter, and photon, which is particle theory of matter. So we look at wave theory of matter, page three and four. So radiation such as light travels through space uh, as two sine waves, an electrical vibration and a magnetic vibration. Now these two vibrations that travel through space, and I'll show you this picture on there there it is right there you have electrical vibration and you have magnetic vibration and if you look at these uh the electrical vibration in this case is uh, the one that is in the blue and it travels in waves and basically they're sine waves now the other one that travels with electro vibration is magnetic vibration and that's basically on the horizontal plane in the orange so these two vibrations, uh, they travel together as radiation and as light. Um, one of the things we might need to know about this is also the wavelength. I've got a wavelength here. So this is the peak of the magnetic vibration and the peak of the other um, magnetic vibration. Well, this is the same 
you can see the magnetic light lines going through here like this and the electro uh, the electric vibration goes down like this right and this is how it travels as light and this is the direction of the wave so these two are together two parameters for categorizing different types of electromagnetic magnetic radiation are the wavelength um, and the source is in meters. We know that we're not going to have a meter of a wavelength, but our units are in the meters. And then frequency, which is hertz, and that's cycles per second. So the frequency is the cycles per second. So how many of, so this is the wavelength from the peak of the magnetic vibration to the peak of the other magnetic vibration. That there is the wavelength. The shorter the wavelength, the more power and energy it has. The longer the wavelength, the less power and energy it has. So frequency and wavelength are inversely related. Uh, that's how I was saying the longer the wavelength the, uh, and the, the uh, longer the frequency, we have less power. So here we got frequency is F, the speed of light and the wavelength. So that's how I get my, sp uh, my frequency. And it given to you at the speed of light, in this case is 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. So that's, that is the speed um, of light and the uh, wave, uh, wavelength in meters. So we go photon particle theory of light. Radiation has properties of particle with energy. Photons do, do not have mass, but can com be compared to packets of energy that move at the speed of light. Photon energy is directly proportional to frequency and inversely proportional to wavelength. So if it's directly, it's a photon energy, directly proportional to frequency. So the, the, the shorter the frequency, the more uh, photon energy it has, such as the spectrum of light. Uh, UV energy has way more uh, energy than uh, infrared ener energy. Obviously, it's it's inversely proportional to wavelength. The longer the wavelength, the less energy. The shorter the wavelength, the more energy. So, you've got this uh, uh, on uh, page four. You've got this equation here. It talks about energy uh, constant times frequency times constant times speed of light divided by wavelength. So, there's nowhere there's no indication anywhere in your in your module of what this constant is. Um, so I looked it up, obviously, because I, I need to know what this, you know, if I've got an equation, I need to know what it's about. Well, this constant H is Planck's constant. And Planck's constant, I've got it written down here. Oh, yes, and also the, this formula is uh, in your formula book, page 12. So Planck's constant H relates to the energy of one photon of electromagnetic radiation to the frequency of that radiation and it's equal to approximately 6.62617 times 10 to the minus 34th joules a second. So that's the energy of a photon, right? So that's where this comes in. So I'm talking about energy of photon times the frequency is equal to the energy of the photon times the speed of light divided by the wavelength. So in this case here, this H is Planck's constant. And it's the energy uh, that a photon has. Um, chances are you won't be asked a question on this. I'm not sure if I have one or not, but I'll double check. But it just gives you some information, right? Because when we talk about energy and we talk about, you know, the cycles and the frequency and the wavelengths, um, with Planck's constant in there, and I, sh I think they, they should be putting this in, in the book, it just talks about that energy and how it relates. So electromagnetic spectrum. Page five, uh, the spectrum is arranged in order of energy, wavelength, and frequency. So obviously, if the wavelength is small, so is the frequency is small. So here it is here, and you guys have seen this before. So we look at this electromagnetic spectrum, and it starts down here with gamma rays, and then it goes to X-rays, and then ultraviolet rays. This little portion here is our visible light. And it goes, uh, these are all the colors of the uh, the rainbow, right? So violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, and red. <clears throat> and then we get on to infrared. 
which has less energy than even visible light. And then we get into the microwaves and the radio waves. So that is our electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, when I look at this, uh, these wavelengths are very, very short and very small, higher energy. When they're larger, one like a radio wave, we have very low energy. So energy is high on the left-hand side where your wavelength is small. And when your wavelength is large, your um, energy is low. Humans can only see this, this light region right here. So we can see this. Spectroscopic analyzer commonly use infrared, visible, and ultraviolet light. So when we talk about the ultraviolet analyzers, we're talking about this zone. Uh, we use visible light also, um, and also we use the infrared. So we have the infrared analyzer. Down here, obviously, because our, our wavelength in meters is the shortest, at 1 times 10 to the minus 14th, and over here is the longest wavelength, which is the lowest energy. So shorter wavelengths, higher energy, longer wavelengths, less energy. So that's our first, uh, first learning objective. Second, describe the absorption and emission spectrums. Atoms are the basic components of matter made up of nucleus and electrons. And then the nucleus is, is uh, what's in the nucleus? You have protons and neutrons. The outermost electrons have the highest energy and can absorb electromagnetic radiation, EMR. So this electromagnetic radiation is what we're going to be talking about. And the outermost, uh, outermost highest level of energy, we're talking about the electrons uh, in the outer shell. And from first year and stuff, we know that that's the valence electron. That's not important. So we look at here, we got the positive nucleus and the negative electrons. We have the valence shell out here. Uh, the excited electrons emit radiation when dropping back to the normal state. So if they're excited, they will actually produce light. Some chemicals will, will produce light. Um, when they're excited and then they go back to the normal state, light is given off. So this emitted these this emitted energy usually falls in the visible and ultraviolet regions. We'll talk more about that one at, uh, near the end of the ILM. So when electro, uh, electrons in the outer shell, the valence shell, uh, get excited, get, absorb energy. So they absorb this, this uh, mag electromagnetic energy. They get excited. When they lose that energy, which uh, is constant, they emit some sort of energy and that's visible light or again, some emit ultraviolet light when they uh, reduce that energy level. And that we're talking about just the electrons. And of course, depending on your molecules or atoms, uh, there's different absorption levels and there's different emit emission levels of light. So the spectrums, White light contains all the wavelengths from the visible region. So we got white light um, that, that contains all the colors of the rainbow. If an object doesn't absorb light, it's white. After an object absorbs visible wavelengths, the light uh, cha uh, changes color. If an object absorbs all visible wavelengths, then it's black. So if it, it in this case here is something that's white so if you see something white like a piece of paper that's completely white um, it's not absorbing any light if you see something black like the ink on a paper that absorbs all the colors so here's a white light here shining and i've got all the colors of the rainbow it goes on to this object and the only thing you see is the yellow light because the rest paper uh, it absorbs only the yellow and the rest just go pass through it. So that's how we see different colors. Lowest energy of the visible light spectrum is your red, 
and the highest is your violet. Again, because your wavelength is the highest here. It's a, it's a shorter wavelength, and this is a longer wavelength. All right, I'm just going to, somebody tell me, am I still on? <laughs> I'm nervous. <laughs> yep, you're good. Okay, perfect, thanks. Okay, electromagnetic radiation emissions, page eight. Two types of electromagnetic radiation, EMR, we're going to be calling it now. Continuous, and that's from a heated filament, and line is from vapor lamps. And I'll explain that. Light refracts, bends as it passes through a prism. So I'm looking at this here. I've got a heated filament lamp. So these heated filament lamps, anything that has a filament gives the whole spectrum of the light, of the visible light. Uh, we, we shine this onto a prism. We have electromagnetic radiation, which is all that light that's coming from here. It hits a prism and it deflects. And as I turn this prism, I can change what uh, wavelength of light that I'm sending to my detector. So this will just turn this way or and back, back and forth. Each wave light ref refracts to a different angle through a prism. So rotating the prism measures the EMR wavelengths and plots them on a continuous emission spectrum. So in other words, when I say that it's a continuous emission spectrum, it's all the light uh, of, of the visible light spectrum. So it's continuous emissions. So in this case here, I've got all, all the lights. So I've got all the visible. I have some UV and some infrared from, from this filament. Most of it's here in this, or the what we're going to be using is in the visible spectrum. So the hotter the object, the higher the energy of the peak wave uh, length. So when I'm doing an analysis, my initial analysis, uh, the light hasn't heated up enough. With the mid-range analysis, you can see my peak coming up here. This is the intensity this way, and this is the wavelength this way. And then the final analysis is actually right here in the IR. So that's where the peak is. So it does have some UV, it does have visible radiation, it does have IR. And this is this is the highest intensity. So the hotter the object gets, the more IR it has also. So it says increasing metal uh, filament temperature. So we'll talk about a little bit more about this, about these uh, metal filaments and about the vapor uh, lights too later on. So as a filament in, in my, even an incandescent light, as a filament heats up, the wavelengths are shorter and have more energy. Now this takes, that takes seconds, right? This is uh, not even milliseconds actually for a light bulb to heat up. Line emission. So with line emission, we're not using a filament. We're not using heated metal. We're using a gas in here, a vapor lamp. So most of us know we have sodium vapor, mercury vapor, metal halide vapor. Um, there's all sorts of, the, uh, of, of different types of metal halides. Um, we mostly talk about UV, oops, I should say sulfur and, uh, and mercury. So high, high voltage arc pass through low pressure gases, electrons in the, uh, in the atoms, the vapor excited, and then lose energy and emit an EMR. So once they get excited uh, and then they come down to normal state, they emit electromagnetic radiation. The energy and wavelength can depend on the atom of the gas. So what type of gas we have is uh, the type of energy and wavelength we're going to get. So in this case here, rotating the prism measures all EMR wavelengths and plots them on a continuous emission spectrum. But in here, line emission, we're only getting certain 
notice the, the, the other one, the continuous, we had actually a wave form. This one, we have this light, we have this light, uh, we have this light, this light. So these are called line emissions because all, all of these wavelengths, this one, this wavelength, this wavelength, this wavelength are coming through this um, vapor lamp. So whether it be methyl halide, whether it be mercury, whether it be sodium. And again, when I take this prism and I select this prism here and I turn it, the detector is going to either get the UV light or it's going to get the visible light or it's going to get the IR, depending what I'm, I'm looking for and what I need. Obviously, it depends on, on the, the, uh, the chemical or whatever of interest that I'm looking at. Electromagnetic radiation absorption, page 11. So again, I've got this hot filament. So if, if I've got a filament, it's always continuous emissions. I've got a whole, I've got the wave, I've got the whole wave of light. So it goes through uh, this gas. This is, this is my filter. And it will basically absorb specific wavelengths. And they won't let them pass through. So certain gases will absorb wavelengths and then they won't even come through. So electromagnetic radiation EMR absorbing is the removal of energy from a radiation beam that uh, um, substances such a process gas sample placed in its path. So I'm placing this gas in the path and it's absorbing uh, all the radiation, the EMR that I don't want to go through. And again, because it's continuous, here's that light filament. It is continuous, all right? It's a continuous wave. The other one is with lines. We'll have a line here and a line there because it doesn't emit a continuous spectrum. And there it is. This part of it on the continuous spectrum, if you see these things, that's absorption. So it's absorbing at different wavelengths and you can see the absorption peaks. So this is, this is my wavelength and this is being absorbed. How much is being absorbed is determined by each one of these peaks. Normally peaks are this way, right? But because we're absorbing it, we're taking away that light spectrum and we have the peaks that are downwards and that's absorption peaks. And that's why they're, they're pointing down. Uh, the light that's being absorbed is, is from the detector or from, from the gas is, is those absorption peaks. So question six to 10. Next objective, chapter three, describe the principles of analysis and application of spectroscopic analyzers. Spectroscopic analyzers use light absorption and emissions for qualitative and quantitative analysis. The following types of uh, spectroscopic analyzer exist. So you got photometric analyzers, spectrometers, ambient air pollution analyzers. So sulfur dioxide and nitrogen monoxide are measured in ambient air with parts per billion using analyzers with electromagnetic radiation. So when we're talking about sulfur dioxide and analyzers, and which we'll do in the, in, in, uh, the next few uh, ILMs, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about the electromagnetic radiation and measuring parts per billion for, for sulfur dioxide. Photometric analyzers measure concentration using EMR for quantitative analysis. Classifications, infrared photometers, uh, visible photometers, ultraviolet photometers. <clears throat> and then, so what we say is that these are actually going to be analyzers too. And we talk about infrared analyzers, and we talk about visible light, and we talk about ultraviolet analyzers. So in this case here, uh, this explains a wavelength selector. So typically to your, um, in this case here, typically to your prisms, we turn the prism, all the wavelengths come through the prism, but we turn it to select these wavelengths. Well, this little guy here, it's a wavelength selector. So I've got an EMR source, whether it be uh, continuous or line, it goes through this wave selector. 
Now this wave selector selects the wave of choice depending on what we're sampling. So if we're, if we're sampling something like SO2, we would grab a specific wavelength that SO2 absorbs. And this is my sample cell. So the sample comes in, it's got my uh, atoms or molecules uh, of interest, and then it goes out. This wavelength selector selects the proper wavelength and we tell it, we know what it's going to be anyway, because that's how we set up our analyzer. And then it goes through the sample cell and it absorbs some of the, the light from the selected wavelength. Then I get this wave, same wavelength coming through, uh, but it's not as much as that's going in. And then I get my uh, electromagnetic radiation detector and it gives me a concentration of the readout of what is in my sample. And each, each uh, molecule, we use different wavelengths because each molecule will absorb different, completely different wavelengths. So the wavelength selector only allows the EMR wavelengths that are, that is of interest to pass through. So if I have, if I have a wavelength passing through that does, doesn't get absorbed by SO2, what's the point of putting it through? So we just uh, we select the EMR wavelength of interest, and obviously those are set up um, by the type of analyzer that you buy. If we were concerned about a SO2, we would use an EMR that SO2 absorbs, right? So that 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 makes it easy for us. If we're using NOx or if we're using uh, different things, different elements and different compounds, then we'd use different wavelengths. Photometric EMR source provides the radiation that the sample absorbs. So when we talk about uh, source example, this is almost backwards. The type of radiation, uh, you got 0.8 micrometers to 1,000. You get 400 nanometers to 800 nanometers, and then you've got 100 nanometers to 400 nanometers. So electrically heated wires, we're going to get this infrared, most of the infrared spectrum. Incandescent lamps, uh, this is all the visible light. Um, you'll also, as you can see, you'll also be getting with, with uh, incandescent lamps, you'll also be getting a little bit of uh, ultraviolet in there too. Um, mercury vapor, mercury vapor is, mo is all ultraviolet. So these are our sources. Um, so anything that's, this is electric heated wire, so that'd be like your filament, right? And, and your filament is in an incandescent lamp. We don't talk about sodium here, but this is just giving you uh, examples of what electromagnetic radiation is given off by different type of gases or different type of elements and lights. So here is my metal filament. This is just your incandescent. I get a metal, metal filament here and of course glass bulb that's in on page 14. So hot wires, which is lamp filaments are continuous emission sources. These sources produce a wide range of light wavelengths and they're continuous. So it's gone a basically a continual path. When I get these metal halides, or metal halides, the sodium vapor, whatever they are, mercury vapor. That's they don't have a filament here. They just have the gases. They get high electricity here across them. Um, the electricity goes through and and energizes them, and they give off different uh, EMR sources. So vapor lamps are line emission. So they don't give up off a big spectrum. They give off a line emission, which is uh, very few um, EMRs from the from the spectrum. So these sources produce a limited range of light wavelengths. Your mercury vapor is mostly UV light, and your sodium vapor is visible light, but it also goes into the IR range. Actually, so does so does electroheated wire. So depending on what you're looking for. As far as the EMR, what, what 
what uh, waves it is, what the frequency is, all that kind of stuff, you pick the certain la lamps. So wavelength selector. So this we talked a little bit about this. Uh, it blocks rejected wavelengths and simultaneously allow the selected wavelengths to pass. So I got a mixture of wavelengths that goes into here. It blocks a whole bunch of them uh, through filters, and then the selected wavelength comes through to the cell, and then the selected wavelength goes to the detector. Uh, the light intensity of this detector is proportional to what is in my sample. So B, I've got an EMR source mixture of wavelengths. Um, I've got sample cell again, and it could be different uh, depending on what my um, what I'm looking for, what I'm analyzing. I change out or get a wave selector here. So the only thing they're doing here is they're showing you that the wavelength selector can be before the sample cell, or it can be after the sample cell. It really doesn't matter. It just depends on the manufacturer of your analyzer. So in this case here, uh, the wavelength isn't selected, so it goes through the sample cell, and we know which wavelength we want, so we select it here instead, and then this goes to the detector. So both, it doesn't matter if it's before the sample cell or after the sample cell. That's all this page is saying. And that's a monochromator. <clears throat> Interference filters. Interference filters is a special type of optical device commonly used in process uh, photometric analyzers to pass a desired wavelength while blocking all others. And this is on page 15. So you get this EMR coming through. What happens is you get this reflective glass, semi-transparent reflected film here. As this EMR passes through, it, it deflects off this glass and it goes back and basically what it does is it produces uh, the sine wave that is 180 degrees difference from the original sine wave. And if it's 180 degrees uh, away from it or 180 degrees, it's opposite. So if opposite wavelengths are coming through here, it blocks them coming through because if something's 180 degrees, it wipes it out. So this, this EMR comes through here, goes back here, and it's opposite of, of the waves that are coming in. So what happens is it just completely blocks it out. It, well, they call it destructive interference. So if it's 180 degrees apart, then it just basically nullifies it. And they call that destructive interference. So you can see these wavelengths, the EMR is coming through and it shows you a better thing here. These wavelengths are coming through. So they, they reflect off of this one and they go into 180 degrees. So basically this wavelength is canceled out. So that's how these interference filters work. And they, 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 they can, uh, there can be a lot of spectrum here, a lot of different EMR uh, wavelengths. But as long as this filter can filter them out, they don't exist anymore. And then you get this filter of interest or this EMR of interest coming out of this filter. So the interaction of the peaks, each wave at 180 degrees apart, cancels out the waveform. So basically, they're just telling you how this filter works. And obviously, um, there'll be many light waves through, and it'll cancel everything out except the one we want. And it and it depends on the filter we that we choose for the the analyzer we're using. So filter spectrum again. So here's uh, a vapor lamp. Obviously, it just says hundreds of volts across this. It emits line spectrum. Um, this filter here will take out 289 nanometers interference filter. And then we get this filtered wavelength of choice. So in this case here, these are these are the line spectrums. So we're giving out 254 nanometer wavelengths. We're giving out 289, 313 nanometer wavelengths, and then 365 nanometer wavelengths. All we want is this 289. So we filter out the rest of these. 
So when the spectrum, which is this complete line emission spectrum goes into this filter, the only thing that comes out of that filter is, is that 289 nanometer wavelength of interest or choice. Into the sample cell. So page 17, here's where some math starts. So these sample cells, um, the gas comes in the sample cells and it, it just flows out. So it comes in and flows out. And basically the ER, EMR shines in here and it comes out. So how much of this is absorbed, how much of the EMR is absorbed by the sample is going to determine uh, the concentration by measuring the EMR out. Um, it goes here too, it's got uh, to, to, to look at this, and this is kind of important, is the sap, the path length, how long it is. It's got the cell windows, and it's got the concentration of gas that's inside. And basically what they're saying here is, uh, down here, type of EMR is visible light, <clears throat> the window material has to be glass. If I got visible plus UV, I have to have a quartz glass. And if I have visible plus IR, I have to have a salt glass. And then if I have a wide range UV visible and ultraviolet, I use sapphire. So that's all the window material. Excuse me. <clears throat> so the different type of VMR that's in, uh, um, the glass cell window here has to be um, of this particular material for these particular EMRs. Uh, sample cell path length. So in this case, when we when we talk about liquid samples, which we did before on the uh, uh, chromatic chromatographs, it's, it's less than one centimeter gas samples up to sev several meters. So we can have these gas samples because um, they're not as concentrated as liquids. We can have them uh, several meters for the, for the sample size, and which is the path. So this particular one here, it's showing you on page 18. It says in situ, so that's right in, uh, wherever I'm measuring gas, it's right inside the, the stack or something like that. So it's an open path. Application do not require a sample cell. So what happens here is this sample goes in and it reflects. There's a there's a mirror right here, it reflects off that, goes down to this mirror, reflects off that, and goes through here. So this whole thing is the sample cell. And that's how we, that's one way we can make that sample cell really long is by just using mirrors. So window and mirror assembly, and the window mirror assembly would be here. So the sample goes in. And then we can transmit light through this whole thing. And of course, here it just shows you this, the cell windows. So my, my actual sample cell, my path length is all of this. And it's just a way to increase or decrease my path length. And you're going to understand that in the next couple of slides, because that's part of our formulas that we use for gases. Detectors, ultraviolet invisible EMR detectors. You got photodiodes, you got phototubes, and you got photomultiplier tubes, which is the same thing as a phototube, except it's a multiplier. And it's got many more tubes than a phototube. Infrared detectors, we're going to be using thermal, because we know the infrared, we talk about that is usually hot. Photo detectors. So these, these are our detectors for uh, ultraviolet and visible and infrared. So photodiodes. So in this case here, I've got a diode and I won't, I won't go into the explanation of the diode, but it's a PN junction. And in the middle, they have a little bit of uh, the EMR shines on the, on, the, uh, on the junction, which makes it conduct electricity. So when this when i have an emr that shines on this junction i get current flowing All right so that's photo photodiodes photons travel through a window and allow the diode to conduct electricity current is current flow is proportional to the number of photons 
And that's how this one works, photodiodes. Next one is phototubes. So you have these photons that come in the shine on here and they bounce on this photocathode. They emit electrons and electrons bounce over to the anode, positive anode. As we know, electrons are negative. So as it hits this, it bounces all the electrons off to the anode. And I get, again, I get current flow. So negative photocathodes emit electrons when photons hit them. So my photons are hitting them, emitting electrons, and electrons are going to the anode. The amount of current flow. Hmm. I missed a thing here. What page is that? 2021. Should say proportional to. Yeah. So I missed a, st a statement here. The amount of current flow is proportional to the light intensity. So the amount of EMR intensity that bounces off of here. So the amount of EMR that's, and remember these are the detectors. So this has gone through the sample already and then comes through and then goes to the actual uh, detector. Uh, the intensity of light is proportional to also uh, the amount of light that's shining through, which is proportional to the concentration of my, uh, of my molecule of, of interest. So that's that how that one works. And if you look at this here in the book too, it's on, on page 21. <clears throat> this is the anode. So this this part. And this is the, the photocathode. So when the light hits this, the intensity of light increases the the flow of electrons, which is proportional to the amount or the concentration of our gas of, of choice that we're sampling. Photomultiplier tube. So electrons of photocathode emits multiply on an impact of each dynode plate. Sensitivity increases with the amount of voltage applied across an anode and cathode. So on page 23, 22 and 23, um, it shows you here, this is the EMR. Now remember this amount of EMR is coming from uh, the sample. So it comes from the sample cell, whatever's not absorbed is emitted. And basically when it hits this photocathode, it releases electrons, which are, uh, which are attracted to the dynodes. And every time they hit each one of these uh, dynodes, they multiply. So sensitivity increases with the amount of voltage applied across the anode and cathode. So here's my here's my photo cathode, and here's my photo anode. The EMR hits there, releases electrons. Every time it hits these dynodes, it, du it doubles. It's these dynodes, it doubles, and it's this dynode, it doubles. And there's many of them, it, it, it goes a lot. If you look at this voltage here from this uh, photocathode over to this anode, we have 800 volts across this. So there's some fairly high voltages. So that's how this detector works. And you can see here, these are the dynodes, right? These are all the dynodes and, and they're, they've got, they've got partitions or separations between them. And as they go like this, that's the dynodes. Photon multiplying tube. The dynode acts as a multiplier, multiplies the electrons given off. Infrared detectors, you know that infrared is a heat. So we use thermal detectors, IR radiation and converts to temperature. And then photo detectors. Thermocouples are used uh, to change temperature to voltage. So my thermal detectors for I, uh, IR are thermocouples and thermopiles. Well, thermopile is a whole bunch of thermocouples in series. So obviously the thermopiles will give you more uh, voltage. Um, so if you need more sensitive uh, equipment, you use thermopiles. Now the photo detectors, photo, uh, photoconductive detector, change electrical conductivity proportional to the IR radiation. 
Photovoltaic detectors generate electric current proportional to the IR radiation. Now remember, these are detectors, so this is what's coming through the sample cell. And of course, the temperature up here is going to be proportional to the concentration of our sample that we're looking for, and here also it's going to be proportional. So you have intensity in, here's our sample concentration, and you get intensity out. The intensity out is going to be less than the intensity in because this sample is absorbing some of these electromagnetic radiation. And then it goes to the detector. The detector gives a voltage or current signal out here and you get a readout. And if you look at here, it's parts per billion, or parts per million, sorry. When we talk about uh, concentration, we talk about concentration proportional to the log in divided by the log out, which is intensity. So intensity, intensity, the log of intensity in divided by log intensity out is going to give us our concentration. In this case, it just says converts electrical signal from a detector to a concentration reading. And so this does all the, the detector sends out the voltage or current signal and this readout device does the log of intensity in again intensity out. Spectral photometers. What we're doing here is a spectral photometer, our laboratory anal analyzers that plot absorption spectrums. So in, in a lab, I know what I'm using as far as a standard. So in this case here, I'm putting CO in here, um, ethyl oxine, oxide, methanol, methyl chloride. Now these here are the inverted peaks. And we talked about that as being absorption. So the intensity is here. So I've got zero to 100% intensity. And then the wavelengths. So these are the different wavelengths in micrometers right here. So this would be the spectrum that I would get out of that analyzer. So what I do is I use my analyzers and I use my uh, spectrophotometers and I place them against known uh, uh, known, known spectral photometers that are done in the lab, which is intensity against wavelength. Used for qualitative analysis to identify unknown substances with known compounds. So this is what I compare it to. Spectrophotometers use a continuous emission source to provide a, a range of wavelengths. So that would be uh, a metal, it would be a filament, and uses a wavelength selector, monochromator, to separate each wavelength. So here I have my EMR source, and that's, the, that's continuous because it's, it's talking about a continuous emissions, and if it's continuous emissions, we know that it's a filament or heated metal line. Here's my EMR, goes into my sample cell. My variable wavelength selector is here. Uh, that selects the, the wavelength of choice, goes through my EMR detector. I have intensity and I have wavelength. Disperse monochromators, select a single wavelength from a group of wavelengths. The prism will do that. Diffraction grading will do that. And we'll talk a little bit about those two. So this is a prism. <clears throat> if I have all white, these are all wavelengths in the visible spectrum, goes through my uh, prism, it defracts all my colors. And again, the red is the largest as far as uh, hertz frequency. And this is the lowest, so I have the most energy down here, violet. Prisms are transparent triangular devices that bend or refract radiation as it passes through them. And it shows you right here, there's this little thing here, and it's called, it's a slit going into the, into, uh, basically it's going to go to the uh, sample cell. And by turning this prism, I can ch choose all these colors. And then depending on what what I'm what I'm measuring in here and what that molecule will absorb is determines what light I'm going to shine through. So when white light travels through a prism, it dispersed into colors of the rainbow. 
And again, this is the from least intense to most intense as far as energy. This one's a uh, diffraction grading. So the EMR hits this. And it's, it, what happens is there's a whole bunch of, of um, it's almost like it looks like a, a file, but it microscopically, <clears throat> light hits there and some bounce back and some keep going. And that's how we select, um, that's how we select which color we want or which wavelength of EMR we want. So a diffraction grading consists of a large number of parallel grooves ruled into the surface of either a reflective or transparent material. And then you get bounce back, which cancels them out. Radiation strike in the grooves creates waves that interact with one another, and that's our interference. So those waves that we don't want, we change the way that the grooves are. So as the EMR hits here, we can move that diffraction grading to choose which color we want it, uh, to basically refract onto the detector. So it cancels all the other wavelengths out. Next, on to learning objective four, and that's describe the Beer-Lambert absorption laws to infrared and ultraviolet absorption analyzers. So this is these analyzers we're, we're going to be um, in our sample cell. We're going to be absorbing infrared and ultraviolet absorption, and again we'll get we'll delve right into this in these. IR ILMs and the UV absorption analyzers. So beer Lambert's absorption laws. This is the sample cell we talked about. Uh, we need the path length, which is important in our, in our formula. We've got gas or liquid sample concentration, which is going to be C. We've got intensity in from my EMR. And then we have absorption that happens here. And then we have EMR intensity leaving the cell. So this is this will be going to the detector. The sample comes in, and it, it continually comes in and, and goes out. This out would be to waste. So sample transmittance, that's the amount of EMR that makes it through the sample. So when I talk about intensity, I'm talking about transmittance. So the, the intensity in and the intensity out, how much, how much goes in and how much goes out is basically the transmittance. So I have some there here, but it goes all the way through. So I have percent transmittance here. So sample absorb, uh, absorbance, the amount of EMR that is absorbed in the sample. So when my intensity of the light comes in, absorb, the, absorb through the gas, and then the leaving the intensity should be less. If not, this, there's nothing in here that absorbed that light. So for here's here's uh, some an example, and it's page 31. I don't I've changed the um, on 30 all of these questions that I'm or these uh, examples I'm giving you are different from the book. That just me, that's just so that you guys can actually go through the ILM again and have, have a look at, at the ones that are in there and sort of follow them through as far as our calculations. So it says here, photometric analyzer measures the intensity of light passes through a sample to be one quarter of the intensity of the light entering. What is percent transmittance? Now, in your formula book on page 12, I think it is, if, if it's the same one. Anyway, it's the process analyzers. And it's, it's transmittance is equal percent transmittance over 100. Very easy. So fractional transmittance equals T, which is transmittance, equals intensity out, intensity in. Fractional transmittance, I've got my T equal to one quarter, because it tells me right here, one quarter of the intensity. So my transmittance is 0 0.25. My percent transmittance is transmittance times 100. So 0.25 times 100 would give me 25% transmittance. So 25% of the light got through. So when we talk about transmittance and then we talk about absorbance, they're opposites. It's complete opposites because absorbance is what has been absorbed by the gas. And this is what we're talking about here now, sample absorbance on 32 and 33. 
Absorbance is logarithmic. Transmittance is linear. Calculate the absorbance when the percent transmittance is 75%, and then a, a second sample is 35%. Just to clarify that, because it's a little confusing when I say 75% and 35%. Those are two different samples. <clears throat> so on 33, you have your percent transmittance and absorbent scales. So here, if I look at this scale, I've got 0 to 100%, and that's transmittance. And this is absorbance. If I've got a, a transmits to 100%, I've got zero absorbance, which makes sense, right? As we go down through here, and let's go to 50, I've got 50% transmittance, and it's 0 0.30, well, a little more than that, 0 0.303 or something like that, or whatever, whatever this is right here. So that's how much absorbance is happening. So the, this scale, uh, absorbance scale, is plotted along the percent transmittance scale. Because this is logarithmic, logarithmic, it doesn't it doesn't match up equally with with the transmittance scale. And I'll show you how how we use the calculation. So absorbance A is the log of the intensity in divided by the intensity out. So basically, uh, the intensity out is going to be the percent transmittance. So I can say absorbance is equal to log of 1 over transmittance. Transmittance is intensity in, out, I should say, divided by intensity in. So in this case here, my transmittance is 75%, so it's 0.75. I got absorbance is equal to log of 1 divided by 0 0.75 which is equal 0 0.125. So if I look at this, and I look at this transmittance, we know it was 75, so 75 is right here. And then my absorbent, if I look right, right, where's my, right here, this is my absorbance. So 0 0.125. So this is, the, this is the calculations, and this is the scale. You won't have a scale. You'll have to use these, these calculations. Because on, on, uh, on the test, I wouldn't put this uh, transmittance and absorbance chart on here. I would just, you would just have to use the, uh, the formulas. So then we're going to go to this one. The, other, the second sample was 35%, uh, and that's transmittance. So I got absorbance is equal to the log of 1 over the transmittance, which is equal to 0 0.456. So let's look at this 35, 30, 35, there's 0 0.40, move over here, 0.56 it's called. So you can see that it matches up there. All right, so there's your absorbance and your transmittent, where the reason they don't line up exactly is because absorbance is logarithmic and transmittent is a linear. Sample concentration, absorbance A is proportional to the sample absorptivity, which is small a, path length, which is small b, and concentration with a small c. Now that's when we get to the sample, um, sample system here. here. Here it is, A is equal to ABC. Again, that formula is in your book. Here's my sample cell. So when I talk about uh, a, that's the absorbance is A. The absorptivity of the gas is small a. The path length is going to be small b. And the concentration, which is the sample concentration, is C. So absorbance A is equal to log of intensity in, intensity output. So that's no difference. So if I get an absorbance, then I can I can have my intensity in and intensity out. I can figure that out. Absorptivity is proportional to constant that depends on the type of substance that absorbs the electromagnetic radiation. And that's wavelength specific, and that's why we have a wavelength selector. Transposed, small a, which is my absorptivity, it's equal to absorption. 
And then of course the B is the path length and the C is the concentration. So that's that's all that this is transposed. So if I'm looking for just absorptivity, I would transpose that to this. Which is equal to A. <clears throat> and all I'm doing here is going absorptivity is in uh, path length in centimeters and concentration in moles per liter. Um, so I've got L over C centimeters times moles. Oops, where'd it go? So that, that's going to be my formula transposed. Now, when we do a sample, here's a, here's a, um, a sample concentration. Goes carbon dioxide has absorbance of 0 0.71. So that's my small a. When a sample concentration is 50 ppm, which is my concentration, and the cell length is 20 centimeters, that's the length of my cell, what is absorptivity? I'm sorry. Yeah, absorptivity. The absorbance is 0 0.71. I, that's, that's a large A. So I'm looking for absorptivity, which is small a, is equal to large A divided by B and C, which is uh, length of my cell and my concentration of my gas. So easily put into, into the formula, 0 0.71, 20 centimeters, and 50 ppm. So I have 7.1 times 10 to the negative fourth per centimeters at ppm times ppm. So this would be what I'm looking for. And as I say, there are, there are some um, calculation samples in the book. I've just changed up the numbers myself to give you guys a chance to do them on your own in the ILM. The absorbance changed to uh, 0.65 when a new concentration of carbon monoxide was introduced. What is the new concentration? So in this case here, I've got a new concentration of uh, carbon monoxide. This here is my absorbance. So it just changed from 0.1 to 0.65. All I'm doing is taking this, the, 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 um, the concentration changed here, but the, the cell length stayed the same. So it's giving you, um, it's giving you different concentrations, which is your, is, which is your, in this case, 50 ppm. So how would I figure that out? I would use, I would transpose this formula for concentration now. <clears throat> now I have my um, absorptivity, which is this, because we figured it out here. So that never changes because it's the same gas, but the concentration is different. I have my absorbance. It's changed to 0.65. My cell length won't change. So that's, uh, um, 20 centimeters and the absorbent small a is going to be um, this here. So I get 0.65 is absorbance. I've got my absorptivity and then I've got my cell length. And when I'm looking for my concentration, it's going to be 45.7 ppm. All we're doing here is just basically transposing the first formula, which is uh, this one right, let me go back to it. This one right here. So we can all transpose. These are pretty easy transpositions. Okay. One of the things they state on page 35 is talking about, um, we talked Beer Lambert's law and how it is linear. All that it's saying here is that if I get a higher, higher concentration and the higher concentrations um, are right here, I start to deviate from Beer Lambert's law of, of, that is linear. Not quite sure why they put that in there, but they do. So as the concentration gets higher, uh, that Beer Lambert law deviates uh, from a linear scale. There's a couple more I, uh, ILM examples that you can follow in your um in your ilm and i won't go through them all i'll just leave that up to you um cell path length we can change that cell path length reducing the cell length reduces absorbance and that also can be construed through um, when we look at that and transpose that equation 
So it's use a shorter path length for higher concentration ranges and a longer path length for lower concentrations. And all that does is if I've got a longer path for lower concentrations, I'll have more absorption because I have more of that component in there. And it says uh, if the old upper range is 20 ppm with a path length of 10 on carbon monoxide, what would the path, what would the new path length for upper range value of 50 ppm be? So basically, this calculation, and I'm not positive, but I think it is in your ILM also. Not your ILM. Your... No, I don't see it. So it's not, this is this is commit to memory. It's not in your uh, ILM or, or your formula sheet. So new path length is equal to old path length times old upper range value divided by new upper range value. So this is the old path length is 10 centimeters times 20 ppm divided by 50 ppm, which would give me my new path length of 40 centimeters. All right. My last objective, describe fluorescence and chemiluminescence. So this will be on page 39 and it's 42. So this just describes, and it's a prelude into these fluorescent and chemiluminescent analyzers. So fluorescence is emissions of lower energy from a substance that absorbs higher energy radiation. So no, no different than your fluorescent light bulbs. This is exactly how it works. So I've got a fluorescent light bulb here. I've got a high voltage going across here. I've got mercury droplet. When I turn this on, these mercury atoms, uh, this turns into a vapor. I turn this mercury into vapor. And what happens if it gives off this UV light from, from this electric current or electric arc that going through, hits the fluorescent coating, and this fluorescent coating gives off visible light. So basically, that's how your fluorescent lights work. So an electric current vaporizes the mercury. Mercury atoms emit UV radiation, and that's a light form. UV radiation strikes a fluorescent coating, blocking the UV radiation, and fluorescent coating emits visible light. So all this coating here, which is around this whole tube, emits that visible light. So fluorescence is going to be important in, in, our, in our analyzers, and we'll talk about that in, in later ILMs. Sulfur dioxide fluorescent. Sulfur dioxide is a fluorescent gas. So when I put UV in, this is sulfur dioxide. So there's a sulfur and then the two oxides, two oxygens. Here's my path. So what happens is that UV light shines and it excites these molecules, sulfur dioxide, and actually, as it excites them, it absorbs the UV, and then it's almost like it's almost like because they're in waveforms, then they get less excited or they go back to normal state. When they go back to normal state, they give off light. And that's visible light. And the light they give off is proportional to the concentration of the sulfur dioxide. So here I've got sulfur dioxide hit by UV. I get high energy and absorption. And it's excited, right? So it's a sitting there excited. Then when it loses that excitement, because the site it's a cycle of these waves, then this emission it, it gives it gives off low energy light. And then this goes back to unexcited SO2 and then it repeats itself. So the intensity of the vis violet vis um, oh, violet visible light is directly proportional to the concentration of SO2. So that visible light is given off and it, it suggests that it's violet. So any of this visible light that, that's given off from uh, when it when it loses its excitation, I get this light that comes off of it in low energy and that's it's violet. So that's the fluorescence from sulfur dioxide. Provides an accurate measurement method of measure SO2 at the parts per billion levels. 
chemiluminescence. When we talk about chemiluminal, this is some sort of chemical reaction. Chemiluminescence is light emission as a result of a chemical reaction. So <clears throat> I've got nitrogen monoxide coming down through here. I've got ozone going in through here. So I've got nitrogen monoxide plus OO3, which is ozone. So it mixes and I get a visible light emitted. So the intensity of the emitted light is proportional to the amount of um, nitrogen monoxide here. So when they mix, they give off visible light. There could be a whole bunch of ozone in here, but ozone will not give off the light unless it is added to my nitrogen monoxide. As soon as all the nitrogen monoxide uh, uh, basically bonds to the ozone, then there's only a certain amount of light that's going to be emitted. And there could be excess ozone. Excess ozone is best in through in here. So this is how the chemin Nessus is going to work, and we're going to talk about that in, in that ILM. So the intensity of the light emitted is proportional to the amount of NO in the sample. Chemiluminescence can measure NO at parts per billion levels in ambient air. So here comes our, our um, environmental analyzers. So all the summary, electromagnetic Spectrum is arranged based on energy, wavelength, and frequency. And again, when we look at this, the shorter wavelengths have more energy. Different atoms produce different absorption and emission spectrums. We have photometric analyzers use filter to perform qualitative anal analysis. Spectrophotometers use a continuous emission source, which we know that that's from some sort of heated element. A wavelength selector and uh, can perform a qualitative analysis. Beer Lambert's law uses linear relationship between the absorbance and low concentration to calculate the concentration of the gas sample. And as they state in the book, if the con concentration is near 100%, Beer Lambert's law sort of deviates from that linear relationship, linear scale. And that's it. For spectroscopic analyzers. I'm going to shut this down. Stop sharing. Stop.